JC on his very own show, John Kudus. Instead of JC being interviewed, he's doing the interviewing. And the people lined up to have a chat with John Kudus are some of Australia's and the planet's most well-known celebrities. Enjoy. Born and bred in Newcastle, he's a true blue Nova Castrian. He won a talent contest at the age of 11, and that then pushed this magnificent ride, forming the great Aussie rock band, The Screaming Jets, in 1989. Then they went on a 12-month tour where they took the live shows to more than 280 performances over that year. Like, that's massive, mate. That's absolutely huge. He's slotted in some other Australian magnificent bands as well, including the Angels, Squire Boys, and the Radiators. He was a vocal coach in a singing competition called It Takes Two. And in 2016, at his beautiful little place in the Gov in Highmarch in South Australia, he was inducted into the South Australian Hall of Fame alongside boyhood idols, the Angels. With his beautiful wife, Mrs. Glitzo, Katie, they are raising two gorgeous kids, Bella, who's 15, and James, who's 12. He's a bit of a drummer too, so he's got the music in him in the spectacular hills of Adelaide. Ladies and gentlemen, on JC's Rolling Success Show, we have David Sean Gleason. <laughs> now that is an intro, JC. Thanks, mate. Gleason, <laughs> mate. I got to tell you, I am so wrapped to have you joining us today. Thank you so much for your time. No worries. It's a pleasure to be here under these, uh, under the circumstances that we're in. It's uh, it's always nice to hook up with someone and have a chat about stuff. Uh, the, the, the normal stuff that goes on in life. Absolutely, man. And we still have to have a lot of this normal stuff because of uh, it's just simply, but there's a lot of shit going on around, isn't there, at the moment? Uh, there sure is. And it's, uh, I mean, it's it's so hard across every uh, across every scope of, uh, of society, you know, the, you, the, what the kids are going through with school and, yeah. and, and then uh, what, what parents are going through trying to make, their, make sure their kids feel okay and feel safe and all that stuff and obviously grandparents it's uh it's it's certainly um uh, crazy times these and, here are crazy times uh, well and also you and i you know we're both in the entertainment industry you know very different facets of course and not being able to go and perform although you've just started back up performing at the gov which we'll talk about shortly um but i gotta tell you i'm i'm missing it i'm missing the audiences i'm missing the crowd what i'm missing most is helping people you know mm. and that, that's a big shock of the system yeah look i mean uh, uh, what we do is uh we obviously have a great time I'm doing it, you know, entertaining yeah. people and, and all that stuff. But uh, it does help people. People, I'm sure they come up to you like they come up to me and say, you know, your songs mean so much to me and they Absolutely. help me get through this and all that yeah. stuff. So, yeah, it's a, it's it's really hard that, that, that it's that one-way street thing, you know. Like, yeah. we're, we're still doing stuff, but there's no kind of instant feedback, which is, right. uh, is kind of hard. And you and I, mate, we feed on that sort of stuff, don't we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. When you're a show-off, yeah. when you're a show-off, Oh, oh, you you do well. You know, <laughs> now look, and we are show us. We we also uh, are very fortunate to have people in our lives that keep us grounded. For me, I have the the beautiful Elsie, and you. You have Katie, who you've been married to for, for more than twenty years, mate. Yeah, now I, I met Katie uh, early on when I was uh, at Ruart Records, which was our the Screaming Jets first record label, and we started up a taboo relationship because Ooh. it was. Um, Fraternisation was frowned upon, um, but I, I used to uh, pretend to be, I'd ring her up at work and pretend to be an American guy called Guido. I'd say, hey, it's uh, Guido here. Can I talk to Katie? And they, you'd hear the, the chick like cover the phone. It's that Guido guy again. <laughs> <laughs> and really it was just Gleeso. <laughs> Gleeso, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Now, look, you, you left Sydney when Bella was born, so about 15 years ago, and you headed for the Adelaide Hills, where I understand alongside Katie's dad who's who's in his 90s um you love doing the you know the digging around and you, you put the gum boots on mate and, and you keep <laughs> the, the beautiful property up there in, in pristine condition is that right yeah look I'm, I'm very lucky to uh we live on the on the in the same house that katie uh grew up in her parents still live on the property and her brother-in-law lives on the property and yeah we kind of my mother-in-law is a uh a rose fanatic she has somewhere <laughs> like 200 rose bushes around the place and that's a lot of thorns, so she just brother. yeah there's a lot of thorns she yeah. cuts them does all the stuff and i just move the piles away and burn them and stuff but yeah it's a beautiful property and we're very lucky to be bringing up a couple of free range kids 
<laughs> I've heard that you're pretty good with a chainsaw too. Yes, I, it's not my favourite tool. I'm, I, I don't, I, I like, I, I don't mind all the other tools, but it's the ones with motors in them and spinning things that scare me. <laughs> well, I don't think I could probably uh, afford to handle a chainsaw. Look at me. There's only. <laughs> If I if I lose a limb, I'm absolutely screwed. You know, it's, <laughs> I can't hop, and I don't want to swim around in circles for the rest of my life. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do know that you love getting your hands dirty because when you weren't singing and, and performing with the Jets and the other bands, you you did a bit of plumbers labouring as well. Before the Jets started, I was uh, working for a bloke, uh, roofing, plumbing, etc. Yep. Uh, and then when the Jets went off the road in 2001, I uh, hooked up with Mark. I, I remember we were digging up a toilet or something and I said, mate, there's got to be an easier way to make money than this. He <laughs> said, there is. Go back to your old job. When that actually did happen I, and I went back to the to the old job, I told him one day, I said, mate, I'm going to have to knock it on the head. I, I've, I've got all these gigs coming up. And he said, but you'll be back, won't you? And I said, I freaking hope not, mate. <laughs> That's because he told me that you were, you were pretty shit out of that, actually. He said, <laughs> he said that you went into a sewer choke and he was out there doing all the work and you were inside having photos and signing autographs with people. <laughs> he has got a great photo of me, actually, where uh, we were doing a sewer choke and we had a, like an a eight-foot hole in the backyard and there was just debris everywhere. <laughs> so I went down to the hardware store. I bought myself some long gloves and a <laughs> face mask and stuff like that. It wasn't for me, that job. And 20 years later, mate, who'd know that you still need that face mask and gloves today? There you go. I was ahead of the curve. You were ahead of all well, you know, I don't call them gloves. I call them shoes. I use them as my shoes, mate. So <laughs> he, he said that one time when you were discovered that you were claustrophobic, but you didn't bother telling him and you were wedged in under a house. <laughs> oh, that was, he loves telling that story because what yeah. happened was we're, un, we're under there and he says, he looks over at me. He goes, you were right. I said, I'll get a bit claustrophobic in, uh, in, in, confined spaces i'm also worried about spiders and he said oh there'd be no spiders under here he said it's just the guy told me it's just been fumigated and i said what type of poison do they use he goes get out <laughs> get, just get out i don't need you under here anymore <laughs> <laughs> oh geez just been fumigated so there's no spiders but there's dead bodies and that under there yeah yeah, yeah. I, I found the profession that i like and uh i was just uh doing the plumbing to fill in time the other thing that he wanted me to ask you was something called two dollar heavy Two dollar heaven. Well, that was uh, <laughs> that was when we'd get rained off on a uh, on a Friday morning. We'd go straight to two dollar heaven, where which was open from eight o'clock in the morning. You get two dollar scooters. Starter. An early opener. And I do remember one time. I hope my wife's not in earshot, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, we go there. It's like nine o'clock, and she calls up. She says, "Oh, it's raining so much. You still working?" I said, "Yeah, we're inside at the moment. We're we're doing stuff inside. What we were doing inside was drinking two dollar scooters." Two dollar heaven. Mate, how good's that place, eh? <laughs> Spent a lot of time around Balmain and, and Rose Hill and stuff like that. They've got some great pubs. They've also got some wonderful places in Newcastle. Oh, I used to love the brewery up there in Newcastle. I went there a few times with the New South Wales cricket side. You are born and bred in Newcastle, so you're a crazy Nova Castrian. When the Knights won in 97, they won the grand final in 97, and there were mad celebration. And you, how did you find out that the Knights won the competition? We were, uh, we'd been at a wedding. Uh, uh, on the Gold Coast on the Saturday yep. and we had a flight back home on the Sunday. Watched the first part of the game, first 10 or 15 minutes, and then we had to leave for the airport. We got on the plane and it must have been a, an afternoon flight because just before the plane took off, I could still hear the radio. So I listened and I jumped up in my seat. I said, the Newcastle Knights have just won the grand final. And no one cared. Yeah, of course. Uh, my wife was, was perplexed because I'm a Dragons fan. <laughs> oh, no, are you really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd been a Dragons fan since 1975 and the, oh, wow. the Knights didn't come along till 88. So yeah, I was right. well entrenched in the Dragons camp. Yep. But uh, having said that, being a proud Novocastrian, as you say, uh, was still a huge thrill. And, uh, yeah, we made, we made sure we were part of the uh, celebrations. 
Now, the celebrations happened, from what I can remember, at Civic Park. Yes. Right, tell us a bit more about that, because I've, I've been talking to a, a mutual friend of ours in Matty Johns. Right, and right. He, and he asked me to ask you about the celebrations in Civic Park. <laughs> well, I rang up uh, my manager, or our manager at the time, Aaron Chug. Chuggy, I said, look, we've got to get involved. Um, and Grant Wormsley, who was living in Newcastle at the time and founding member of the Jets, like myself, yes, uh, he was able to... Uh, organised for a truck and a PA, got up and we played. Oh, strangely enough, um, Finbar Fury from the Furies was there and he got up and played a bit of fiddle and then the crowd went nuts. We were playing some song and the crowd just absolutely erupted and there was best estimates of 80,000 people at the, uh, at the hell. park that day. So there were um, and the cre- people there that what they were at the grand final. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It was a huge, huge uh, event for Newcastle. Anyway, the crowd goes nuts and I turn around. The whole team is on the stage uh, while we're doing playing better. And then uh, Joey and Maddie come up to the mic and we're, oh. they'd lost their voices already by oh, that stage. But, yeah. but they were still uh, having a scream. Uh, Joey was uh, stage diving into the crowd. And then, of course, um, we they said, oh, come with us on the bus. So um, we jumped on the bus and went on a pub crawl with them. It was probably about three days later. It might have been the Friday, Thursday or the Friday. My wife rang up and said, where are you? Yeah. And I said, celebrate the Knights being <laughs> final win. She said, you don't play for the Knights. As a matter of fact, you don't even support the Knights. What are you doing? Get home. So, yeah, you know, that well, was a fantastic uh, few days. I'll never I'll never forget all the things I've forgotten from that uh, those few days. But Newcastle to win that at that time when like, BHP had closed down, you know, and it's a real working class city and it's just yeah. what they needed, isn't it? Oh, they beat the Silver Tails. It was oh. on the bell. I mean, it was with, you know, no time left on the clock. Darren oh, Albert gets good good down. Yeah. yeah, brilliant, brilliant. You know, when Absolutely Jack brilliant. pulled a dummy half up the blind side and then flicked it back to, to Albo, and when, oh. he put, when he put that ball down... He jumped know, about 10 feet in the oh, air. Oh, <laughs> mate, the, the eruption, the, the Newcastle <laughs> volcano of eruption that happened. You know, to see the Chief and, and, and those oh. guys was just unreal, wasn't it? It's just what they needed. It really was. It really was. It was a, a great time for Newcastle. And then, of course, to, to back it up um, only four years later with another one, it was yep. um, the show that, the, you know, Newcastle was a, a team to be reckoned with. So is my Panthers. Oh, the Panthers. Oh, yeah. well, they're, they're a dead set cert to get in the old, uh, to get in the grand final, aren't they? If they don't get in the grand final, there's something crazy going on. Mate, you just put the mocker on us, Gleeso. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Oh, the Dragons will end up in there. And then Gus, to me, Gus is the greatest rugby league coach of our modern era. You know, what he does for the younger guys and all that coming through as well, I think is mm. absolutely magnificent. And it's been a fantastic effort and, and great that the Warriors have actually signed both of them to go over. Yeah, yeah well, that's the thing. I mean, it's a culture thing, isn't it? And Gus is perfect for culture. He's uh, oh, he, he knows all about the game. Yep, yeah, I agree, mate. And one thing that rugby league is, it's a family. You know, it's a yep. very, very big family. And, and, and I want to ask you about your family, you know, Paul and, and your mum, Glennis. And there were five kids and then your mum and dad, they adopted to, is that right? Yeah, so uh, there was six of us. Then mum and dad uh, used to foster kids. Yep. We fostered kids from um, bad backgrounds and stuff yep. like that. But it used to be a grace period when people wanted to adopt their kids out. They'd have like six weeks to change their mind, just make sure they were doing what they wanted to do. And yeah, so we'd, we'd have those babies. Sometimes they'd be in our house for six weeks. Sometimes they'd be in our house for three months. Yep. And sometimes there was more than one of them. I remember on a couple of occasions, my older sister, Joanne, looking after a baby at the same time while she was still in high school and stuff like yeah. that. Upshot of that was you, the only way you'd really know that the baby was gone, coming to the house and mum would be just absolutely beside herself with sadness and crying. And it was yeah. it was a very emotional time every time. And we had lots of babies through the house. Lee came along, my, my sister, who would be probably 40 now. Uh, yeah, she's 40. Uh, she came along. She was quite sick when we first got her. She had uh, developmental difficulties. She was just in our foster care. Took quite some time till uh, mum and dad were able to adopt Lee. Timmy was a baby. He was of Chinese uh, origin. He was born severely handicapped. He was born without eyes. And without eyes? Yeah, yeah, without eyes. Had other problems as well. He was very difficult. No 
one really wanted to adopt him because of yeah. the difficulties that came with it. So I think the talk was that he was going to be institutionalised. Mum and Dad decided that that, uh, that wasn't going to be happening. So we adopted him as well. So yeah, we went from a family of six to a family of eight. Always, uh, or there was always, as I say, uh, foster kids through the place and yep. that type of thing. So Mum and Dad were very, uh, very good with that type of civil mindedness, I guess. My Mum and Dad the same. You know, when I was born, I was meant to go, go to an institution and even in that era, a lot of kids didn't survive because the parents had an mm. opportunity to terminate at birth. Um, but my mum and dad said, no, no, we're taking him home. Thank God they did. But I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I've got two brothers, I've got an older brother and a younger brother and they're both mentally retarded as well. They're not really, I just tell them they are because they look like, a, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but your, your mum, mate, and, and your dad, I mean, obviously your mum was the matriarch of the family and you know, what what a beautiful woman she must have been. Yeah, God bless her. She 52, I think, when she uh, was tragically killed in a car accident, sitting in a roundabout and something fell off the back of a uh, back of a truck and crushed her. Um, so that was 92 and Jets were on tour. We were supposed to play a show at Nambucca, I think, that night when the news came through and that kind of uh, me into a bit of a spin for quite at some time because being in the public eye and commitments, gigs to get back to, which we yep. I think we took about a week or two weeks off and then we're back to it. Wow, mate. That's not a lot of time. No, and you know, a lot, there's there's no actual dealt with grief. You don't know how long it lasts. I mean, there's still yep. times that I, some 20 something years later, I was, there's still times where I think, oh, it'd be nice if mum got the mum was here, yeah, know, yeah. meet me kids or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, it's, uh, Death is a horrible thing. Now, regardless of how it happens, whether, you know, someone's in a lot of pain and it's slowly deteriorating or, or it's all of a sudden, like your mum, it, it's just a horrible thing as humans that we, some of us learn to deal with it in so many different ways, don't we, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, there's, uh, and there's, there's no rule book, you know, that's, that's I guess, the hard part. It's like, uh, it's like any of those big moments in life. There's some guidelines that people can set down or, or give you kind of a bit of a heads up about, but there's no hard and fast rules as to how you uh, deal with things or move on or cope with stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right, mate. So, look, you said there was six of you. Where, where are you in the pecking order? Middle child. Suck, dude. Poor me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had... Uh, me. You just said poor me. <laughs> Pour me another drink. I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yes, I have uh, an older sister, Joanne, and then Jared, and then Anthony, then me, yep. and then and then Angela below me, and Helen below. Uh, Angela so I, yeah I mean it's hard to be a middle child when there's six of you that's where I put myself but imagine being the last one had all the hand-me-downs and that that you got to get yeah well, that's right we uh we were big on hand-me-downs in our house we uh <laughs> I remember one time people used to give us clothes you know yep. every now and again and one time we got uh some clothes and that had one brand name thing in it was trackers board shorts my nana always thought that my brother Anthony who's one up from me yeah. was the favourite. It turned out that the only person who fitted the, the board shorts, the name board shorts, was Anthony. And I just remember me nana going, and guess who got the trackers? <laughs> like it was he conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, I remember uh, things like that. We got our first um, name pair of jeans when I think for our fifteenth birthday, you could get what? a pair of Levi's. Oh, Levi's. Levi's Californians. I got not your denim, not your normal denim, Californians. But uh, I've never been yeah. in pants, mate. Just myself. <laughs> 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 Very superfluous. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, and you said you had a brother named Jared. Is that right? Yep. But mum and dad hated him, mate, so they gave him that name, Jared. Seriously. <laughs> no, 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 well, he, he had trouble with uh, Gerard. Oh. People calling him Gerald and all that stuff. But uh, Jerry's an amazing character. He's uh, a psychiatric nurse. Come, he wrote a, uh, a bestseller novel in about '93 called Is Stalker. Really? Wow, that's amazing. You guys are just full of talent, the Gleason family. Yeah, and then well, then we brother. Tony, he's pointed head of Newcastle Knights reserve grade uh, for this season. So he had one game and they called the whole comp off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so he, uh, was he the coach, was he? Yeah, yeah. He, he, was, well, he worked as, did a bit of assistant coaching under uh, Brownie when he was yep. up there at the night. Uh, he's al also coached uh, Berkeley Vale to their first grand final win. Oh, that was probably what 10 now? years ago now. The Gleeson family is pretty famous. In our place, in our, <laughs> in our house, yes. But, uh, and, and Tony, Tony Anthony, he was a copper for 25 years as well. So. <laughs>